Hello, my name is Ryan Grimm, and I want to talk today about the C++ core guidelines. First of all, I'm a big fan of the C++ core guidelines, so anyway. But uh, before that, a few words about me. I'm a software developer since 1999, since the last millennium. Around since 22, 24, I don't know it so exactly anymore. I give seminars for C++, Python, and for our product. Since 2016, I'm an independent C++ and Python trainer. Okay, this is all what's necessary to know about me, so let me start. Why do we need guidelines? The question is quite easy. We have a complex language and a complex domain. Therefore, we need rules which apply or which say what is right by design. So easy. Next point. A new standard is published each three years. In particular, the last one, the 20 standard, is enormous big. It is extremely influential. Therefore, we need a way or a guided way to learn this new stuff. Third argument, C++ is used in safety critical systems. I was, for example, responsible for software on defibrillators, and they should work the way they should work. Or an automotive domain, a supplier of the automotive domain. And therefore, we need, mm, we need to apply this C++ in the right way. And here's my meta rule. When, while I'm a big, big fan of the C++ core guidelines, you have always to reflect your coding habits. Do I do it really the right way or not? Should we do it now differently? And I always say in my classes, when you don't want to fix the code you have written two years ago, you learned nothing in between. Therefore, you have to uh, reflect the way you write code. There are three guidelines available. First of all, you may know Mr. C++. It's a little bit old. It's from 28. This is not the way I want to write code. Okay. It, it was uh, uh, developed by the uh, automotive industry, and for example, I had to apply it on my defibrillators because it's used in uh, any safety critical environment. So what we should do? BMW was in particular responsible for AutoSAS C++ 14. It's way better, now it's based on 14. But this has the same issue such as MISRA C++. It's something which is standardized. In therefore, it will always fall a few standards behind. So what should we do? Of course, this is the reason why I'm here. C++ core guidelines. They are driven by the C++ community, by the best programmer, and they describe how you should use this programming language. But the C++ core guidelines have a few issues. Whom of you know the, knows the book um, Design Patterns Elements of Reusable Software or Reusable Object-Oriented Software? The most important book from my perspective which was ever written in 1994. But you know what? What is typical about this book? This book has a big fall asleep factor. It's totally boring. But anyway, it's extremely important. In the same holds true, is Bjarne here? Oh, I hope not. The same holds true for this book, uh, for this C++ core guidelines. They are totally boring, but totally important. Why? Because each rule is described such as the Gang of Four book in a few steps. Gang of Four has 12 or 30 steps. Here it's about 10. But this is boring. This is extremely good as a reference, but extremely boring as something to read. Therefore, I wrote around 100 blog posts about these core guidelines because I'm a big fan to make it a little bit more entertaining. I said, this is a more important rule, this is not so important, this is redundant, here is the reason missing, so I wrote a little bit about it. Then I asked uh, Bjarne in Herb, 
they should write a book about it. And they said to me, uh, we cannot do it. We have no time. We should do it. Therefore, I wrote a book about it. So once more, I'm a big fan of it. I'm biased. And this is the structure of the core guidelines. To all these topics, you, you get guidelines or answers. I have to say it once. I forgot to say something important. The core guidelines has 350 rules. I assume six or 700 pages. It's way too much. Another issue. So these are the, uh, the topics of the core guidelines. And now what I want to do with you, I cannot be exhaustive, go through each of this topic and describe what is in there from an abstract perspective. So therefore, I will not refer to one guideline or something like that or quote or something, only to give you an idea what you learn when you, when you, um, when you deal with that stuff, when you think about it. Philosophy. Meta rules for so concrete rules. These are rules on, from which you can derive the concrete rules. They are extremely generic. Express intent and ideas directly in code. I often say code should be such as prose. You, you could just read it. There's no need to document it because it's readable stuff. Write an ESO standard C++. Of course, this is trivial. A program should be statically type safe. Of course, we send a uh, statically typed language. And if not, catch the error at runtime. Extremely important issue or virtue. Waste, don't waste resource in space or time. And when you have something ugly, which is fine, put a stable interface around it. Therefore, that no user can see the error message with R from deep, deep below. So this was extremely abstract, but anyway. Let me be more concrete. Interfaces. Here are the few points. And I'm here showing you an example. Orbala, this, this was too much. Explicit interfaces should be explicit, strongly typed, have a low number of arguments, and separate similar arguments. And often in the guidelines, you find a bad example. And you can guess which one is the bad one, or the first one. You, have, you want to show a rectangle, which consists of two points having an x and a y coordinate. Do you know what a, b, c, and d mean? I don't know. Therefore, it's bad. The misuse is extremely likely. Second. This is not a strong type. This is just a double. You couldn't put anything inside. Therefore, you should use a strong type such as a point, which you see in the second line, or the second signature. And what's also, yeah, the misuse of the second line is uh, signatures way, way less likely than the one of the first. Once more, extremely simple example. Let's go to function. And now is one of my favorite table. This table is honestly a result of five or 10 rules. I just put it together into a table. And this is what are in, in, out, and out parameters. When should you apply what? So let's start with in. You should take something by copy. You see func x, I cannot. Uh, I can do a little bit here, func x. You should take something by copy if it's cheap to copy, such as an int, or impossible to copy. Huh? This sounds strange, impossible to copy, because the caller has to move it. And when you don't know, or it's expensive to move or moderate to copy or move, use a const rl value reference. This means when you have a template, it could be something small, it could be something big. Then, when, what, when do you want to take something by non-const R value reference? This means when you want to have something, when you want to be the owner of something, then you take it by R value reference because the caller has either to invoke it with an R value or 
has to apply a stood move. Therefore, it belongs to you. This is transfer of ownership enforced. And then we have non-const L value reference. You only use this kind of uh, parameters when your function has a so-called in-out parameter. Assume you have a vector and you want to change it inside this function. You take it by non-const L value reference. OK. This was easy. Now let me talk about the output parameter. First of all, don't care. Just use a value for an output parameter. You see it in the last line. Because why? Uh, with 17, we have RVO and R, and RVO means return value optimization, name to return value optimization. Don't care, the compiler makes the clever stuff. And the second use case is once more the non-const L value reference. This is this in output parameter, so it must also appear here. And now be aware, I come to the most important slide. Or table. Let me start simple. When a function takes a pointer, and the pointer is a pointer to a C array you used to ac accept. So you have a, a C array, you want to have it, and you take this C array as a pointer to its first element. This is the way we do it with C arrays. Anyway, when you take a pointer, there is an extremely, this is broken by design. Taking something by pointer is broken by design. Why? When a function takes something by pointer, does it, the function now is the owner of this something, or is it just borrowed? You use one signature to transfer two totally different semantics, borrowing versus owning. When the function is the owner of the stuff, which it gets via pointer, the function has to destroy it. If, you not, if not, you would have the memory leak. When the function only borrows it, it it is not allowed to destroy it because this would be a double delete or something like that. Once more, broken by design. And therefore, and here's my key point, in modern C++, we don't transfer ownership with pointers. We only transfer borrowing. So when you have, a, when you have something via a pointer, this is only borrowed to you, meaning there's no reason to delete it because you're not the owner. And similar are uh, uh, references. With a reference in modern C++, you are also not the owner, but you have the guarantee that this reference always references something. With a pointer, you don't know it. You have to check for null putter inside a function. And now let me go, let me explain these five different models of transferring something into a function by value, by, cop, by, by pointer, by reference, by unique putter, by shared putter. What does it mean? From two perspectives. Who is the owner? Who is responsible for deleting something? First of all, when a function takes something by copy, by value, who is the owner? Of course, the function is the owner. It has an independent copy of the thing, and it's automatically destructed because we have something such as in scope, or a stack, however you call it. I already mentioned what it means when you transfer a point or a reference. So what does it mean a unique putter? What does it mean when a function takes something by unique pointer? This means the caller transfers the unique pointer inside the function. This is a transfer of ownership because the caller has to say, stood, move unique putter, because you cannot copy unique putter. This is, once more, Transfer of ownership. Therefore, the function is the owner. It behaves similar to a local object. And now, the last one is a shared putter. What does a shared putter mean? We have two owners, the caller and the callee. And the last guy uh, cleans the stuff up. And now, look at it. When you look at the function signature, and you know this protocol I explained to you in a few words, you immediately know who is responsible for what. And what did you model? And this is extremely, honestly, extremely nice. Now we can express this. 
And now compare this once more with a pointer. Then you, you know what I mean. Pointers are broken by design. OK. Let's go to classes. Classes, uh, class hierarchy organizes to latest class into hierarchy structure. OK, this is boring. But now the interesting point. When do you use a class or when do you use a struct? Hmm. Here's my point. When you have a data type for which all values are possible, there are no restrictions, such as a point, you use a struct. There's no reason to protect here anything. What do you want to protect? Just use a struct, a, a simple data holder. But when your class type, by the way, class type is something which uh, uh, reflects a class, a struct in a unit. When you have a class type, and this class type has an invariant, values which must always be true or values which are not possible. Anyway, how you see it. Such as date. Date has an invariant. There are dates which are not valid. What should be the 15 months? I don't know. Now you establish this invariant in the, the constructor. You make the state private and you protect the state via member functions. And here you need a class. So if when all possible values are not valid, you need a class to establish this invariant, such as here for the date. OK? Then I talk about, this is a little bit more, con uh, more theoretical. Uh, there's the idea of a value type or concrete type. It's a type which is not part of a type hierarchy. And it should support the following member functions. You may have heard this term sometimes. This is called a regular type. Uh, there's also an informal um, term for it. It behaves such as an int. This is what people always say. What is a regular type? A regular type is a type for which the big six are defined. Big six, default constructor, destructor, copy move constructor, copy move assignment, here six, and additionally, swap operator and equality operator. This is a type which behaves very well in the C++ ecosystem, or we call it also value type, regular type. So big six, I will not go into this direction too far because I would have to explain move semantics, which is something I could not do in a few minutes. But anyway, I will give you a few ideas as I mentioned, the t details are in the, in the core guidelines or in my books and you know, all in other books. The big six. The compiler can generate them for you when your data type is simple enough. When your data type has only built-in data types or containers of the standard template library or data types which uh, have the big six, the compiler can auto-generate them for you. And the same must hold for the base classes of this data type. And here's my important rule. Try to build types for which the compiler automatically generates the big six. If not, you will open a dependency hell, in which I will not go now, but believe me, a dependency hell. I always say in my classes, the less you program, the better. And this is in particular true here. Or the better your programs become, to put it differently. So the compiler can, uh, you can request special member function with default. You can delete some with delete. Sometimes a type should not be copyable, such as when you would uh, design money. Um, and there's the rule of zero or rule of six. Let, it, let me quote it here, but I have a little bit of different opinion. Um, you should define all of them or none of them. Your goal is to define number of them. Let the compiler do the complicated stuff. I would say it a little bit differently. When you think about one of them, you have to think about all of the six. Anyway. Because, and next point is, 
you have to define some consistency. Consistently, you have to believe me now, and then you can read it up. Don't maybe implement a move constructor and say to the move assignment operator equal default. You cannot assume that the compiler will generate a move assignment operator with the same semantics such as the move constructor. This is terrible. All of them or none of them. And as I mentioned here, there are terrible dependencies. I only want to well, show you one between the big six. Mm, when you define copy semantic, the compiler will not define move semantic. When you define move construct, the compiler will not define copy semantic, and so on and so on. This is terrible. I don't want to open this thing here. Only give you an idea. Constructor. In C11, we have an extremely nice feature. You can and should uh, define each member direct in the class. You see? This uh, int with equals 640. And here's how you should look at it. You define the default behavior for an instance of a class inside a class, and you provide explicit constructor to modify this default behavior. And when you apply this simple rule, you will get less constructor and more easily to uh, maintain constructors because they would have a lot many uh, less, a less number of arguments. Once more, you encode the default behavior inside the class, and you want to have something special, such as a widget with a special width. You have to provide an explicit constructor. And therefore, you follow this extremely important rule, dry, don't repeat yourself, because you define all in, in one place, in one spot inside the class. Oh, I said this is the most important slide. I'm not so sure if this was right. There's one thing which is extremely difficult, uh, extremely dangerous. And this is what you should apply. Always, I, I'm not sure if I should say always, but I say it. Always make constructor taking one argument or conversion operators explicit. I only show you one example when you do it wrong. Have a look. I have a my class. I have two ways to convert. I can convert to my class, and I can convert my class to class B. For this direction, I need, I need a so-called conversion constructor, a constructor taking an A and returning a my class. This is called a conversion constructor. For the other direction, I need a conversion operator, meaning I need a B, but I, I'm a my class. And therefore, when I define it, I, I, uh, I can be converted to a B. And both of them, such as here, should be explicit. Let me show you only one example. When we have enough time, but I assume we will not have it. Let me only sh Oh, no. Is there an issue here with the internet connection? Is, there, is someone, can someone help me? I'm not sure if it's working, but we see if not, I, I, I have to think about it, how I can improvise. Sorry, sorry. It's really bad that I really tried it out before and it worked. Ah, I'm happy because this is really an issue. First of all, you know, with, with what we started, by the way, it's intentional that I, that I maybe not, could not present all I wanted to present, so it's not so bad. Um, here's what I have. I have a class, my house. This class has two constructors, a default constructor and a constructor taking in, in, a feminine name, a string. What is the idea? I want to rent my house, but I can only rent my house if no family is inside. Just an extremely simple data structure. And to make my life easy, I, I use operator bool. This means now I can use instance of my house in logical context. 
such as an if construct or something like that. This is my idea. Oh, what, why, why, do, why can you just see? Wait a second. Thanks a lot for your remark. I'm not sure why, why, why does this not work. Now I'm fighting with Windows. Let me make this smaller. Now, it's in the foreground. By me, not for me. I'm, I'm not sure what's, what's here happening. Sorry. Thanks a lot for your remark, but anyway, how can I how can I achieve it? Who is the presentation will not? I don't know. Ah, oh, Windows is is making me is annoying me. There's a second screen. I was not aware of that. Sorry. Uh, by the way, I'm a Linux guy. Okay. You see this example, but I cannot see it. So let me, let me, let me show you. Is it big enough? No, wait a second. So I have a, my house. My house has two constructors. One taking a um, uh, default constructor, one taking a string. This is my idea. Let me do it. So, okay. Now, for convenience reason, I have an operator pool, which allows me to use my house in logical contexts. So far, fine, because I'm lazy. Okay. And in operator pool, I check if a family is in my house. If not, I can rent it. This is my story, extremely simple. Okay. Now I can use my house in logical context, you see? Is someone inside? Is someone inside? And here's the answer. The first house is still empty. Familie Grimm lives in the house. Okay, extremely convenient. Makes sense. But mm, this is not exactly what I want. Now I can use my house in context uh, in this required. Because why? Okay, because an uh, implicit conversion from bool to indice applied, which is called, uh, which is called um, in this case, uh, integral promotion. Mm, it's not so bad, but this was not my intention. But now it becomes really funny. I can calculate with houses. Two times first house plus second house. What's that? Of course, this was not my intention. Why does this work? The compiler wants to add numbers. It says, okay, I don't know what plus is. There's no plus defined. What should I do? Oh, I have an idea. I can apply the operator bool to make out of my house an e in, 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 in true or in false. And then integral promotion kicks in and makes a one or zero out of it. I assume this was not, you can assume this was not my intention. And to fix it, sorry, this is extremely difficult. To fix it, oh, I cannot do it. I have to write here. This is too small for me. Oh, this is terrible. I have to write here. Oh, now I can do it. Explicit. Don't consider the bad, um, the bet. Oh, this is terrible because I cannot can can even see it. X. What is too much? Oh, this is terrible. I cannot see what I type. That's why I would do it once more. And extremely slow. X. Please sit. Now it's fine. Ah. And now you can see what is not possible. The compiler says, here we are, there's no conversion from my house to int. This is what you want. And the same applies to conversion constructors. Don't use explicit to make it explicit. And now I have to, okay, let me go back. 
I'm not sure. Let me do it a little differently. I want to do something clever here. I want to animate a little bit, and now it is a little bit uh, complicated for me. Let me go back. Here we, here we end it. Let me go back. And once more, the same applies to, con to the conversion constructor. Uh, why does it not start? Sorry. What can you see? You can see this falling. Now I, I, I make it different. Here, here we are. No? Let me do it differently. This is really terrible today. I don't know what's happening here. Someone is don't like me. Let me reopen it once more. So, animation. Now, a few seconds, then it should start once more. And now you see it. Sorry. Okay, let's continue. First of all, this was maybe too long, but once more, this was totally important. Make constructors and conversion operators explicit. Next point. Only define a constructor when you need it. There are a few companies which, who says, oh, our policy is always to define a destructor. This is nonsense. When you define a constructor, you will not get move semantic, only to give you an idea. This is how C++ works. You only get copy semantics. And here's the rule. When you have a class hierarchy, the constructor of a base class could have two forms, either public and virtual or protected and non-virtual. Hmm. Why? When you use the base class as an interface and you want to de uh, destroy derived classes using the interface, the destructor has to be public and virtual. Therefore, you get a virtual dispatch. When you want to destruct the derived class with the derived destructor of the derived class, you need a protected and non-virtual destructor. These are only two forms. The destructor of a base class should be. This is so easy. And additional, a destructor should not fall, fail, and make them no accept. Okay, let me skip the end. Oh no, this is too nice. Let me show you enumerations. OK. Enumerations are used to define sets of integer values. OK, this is easy. It represents uh, related named constants. But here's the interesting point. Since C++11, you should use enum classes, also called strongly typed enums, scoped enums, or there are different names for it, meaning enums which you see here, in which you use here class or struct. And you can even specify the underlying data type. And there's something very interesting. Let me show you something. Because enumerators, this guy is here, January, January, February. Now I have to do this on the right. Here we are. Let's, be, let's do it once more. It will not go on the right. Now we have it. OK, here's my enumeration. And you see what? Blue is marked red. What does it mean? I say my enum should only have enumerators 
which fit inside a jar. And 128 is too big. It's outside, have a look, outside the range of the underlying type jar. And this is nice. And this is maybe the reason why they are called strongly typed enums. Okay, let's do it a little bit differently. Yeah. Okay, this is now at least working. Ray. Of course, you know Ray. Ray stands for resource acquisition is initialization. What's the idea? You have to take care of something. Could be memory, could be a mutex, could be a file handle, could be, what could it all? Something, a socket, something you have to take care of. And when you forget to remove it, to destroy it, to take care of, you have an issue. You may have a deadlock, you may have a memory leak, you may have a socket which is uh, locked. You have issues. Therefore, you have to take care of. And how do you do that? Extremely simple. You write a class. You put in the construct of the class the initialization or the, the, uh, the acquiring of this resource. In a destructor, it's release. And then you make the class something local. And now the compiler is responsible for taking care of the thing. I, know I call this class a guard object. And now I have a question for you. In which cases, so this, this is a heavily used idiom in C++. Which application of this idiom do you know in C++? Please cry out if you know. G thread is the first important one. Of course, you're right. This is the improved thread from stood thread which was improved with G thread, which automatically um, 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 joins in its destructor things. What? Any other use cases? Logout. The third important one. Logout takes care of a mutex, locks it in a constructor, unlocks it in a mutex, uh, unlocks it in its destructor. Any other use cases? Unique pointer, exactly the third important one, the smart pointers, unique pointer, share pointer. And what is the most important one? This is interesting. You do it the wrong way. The standard template library containers. This is so obvious. They automatically destroy the stuff when they go out of scope, including, of course, to string. So this was easy. This is by far for me the most important tool we have for good software, good names. The most important tool. When you don't find good names for your things, for your functions, for your classes, for your objects, for your variables, for your, for you, you don't have the right abstraction in your head. When you don't find a nice name for a function, Maybe this function does not one, but five jobs. You call it process data, which is a bad name. This is the most important aspect, good names for me, for good software. They should be self-explanatory. And there's a meta rule here, the shorter the scope, the shorter the name. When you have an E or a J, you know this is an, an, an encounter. You, shouldn't, you, don't, you should not reuse them in nested scopes, of course. And read it and say to me which, which characters I used. I don't know it, honestly. Don't use similar looking characters. Ah, yeah. This is also a rule which is extremely interesting. Never mix sign and unsigned arithmetic. Do you know why? Uh, complicated is too less. Terrible. Anyway, but you know why. Who knows what's, what is the result here? Of course, when I, when I have such a strange question, you know that there's something behind. 
have a look here. Now it's here, I should put it on the right. Here we are. How it works, but I cannot see it. You see the results on the right? Is this what you expected? What is happening here? Only to give you an idea. X minus Y is of course not something around a billion. Do you know what's happening here? The, the signed stuff is converted to unsigned and then you get what you have. So don't use it to make it simple. Don't mix signed and unsigned arithmetic. This is terribly complicated. Ah, no, it works. Yep. Let me put this here. I have more place for my mouse. Okay, let's continue. I'm a little bit in the past, but anyway. Good names. Okay, ah, this is nice. First of all, this is a famous quote. Premature optimization is the root of all evil. You, of course, should know David News. Let me give you a few advices. Once more, these are my advices, but they're based on the core guidelines. When you optimize something, don't optimize without measurement. First point. Measure with real-world data. When you have a performance issue, you should measure with the data which are used, not some play data you have. And next, which I think is extremely important, version, versionize your performance tests. Why? When you change anything in your environment, new compiler, new compiler flex, new hardware, new C++ standard, new, 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 you have to apply your test once more because they are not valid anymore. Therefore, they should be available. And second, you know what I hate? I often had a discussion. We made performance tests. We made a specific decision. Two years later, a new developer uh, uh, came in, and they wanted to question our decision. But when you have versionized that stuff, this makes it quite easy. We have so often used different communication frameworks, because this one is now faster. This was terrible. First point. Second point, importance of measuring. Which part of the program is the bottleneck? Without test, you don't know. Second, this is really ridiculous, but I often had this discussion. I give Python seminars. Someone comes to me and says, Python is way too slow for our use case. I say, I don't care. Python is fast enough for agree. You cannot move the mouse so fast that Python would be too slow for you. Therefore, here it's fine. So it's good enough. And the third point, which is often missed when you measure performance, is how fast could your program potentially be? Because you should know when you are done optimizing. You should have a mental model. It could be so fast or not, because you want to know when you are done. When you have concurrency and you do stuff four times, it could not be faster than four times faster. This, is, this sounds ridiculous, but believe me. <laughs> Here are a few general rules, extremely general rules. If possible, implement all with move semantics, such as, for example, the algorithms of the standard template library. They are of move semantics based. Why? First of all, if possible, you can move, which is faster. Second, you can deal with move-only types. Third, when the type is not movable, it can even be copied. And fourth, you get rid of exceptions, because with moving, nothing essentially could happen. So implement your stuff with move semantics. It could be faster, but at least not slower. Second tip, use context space if possible. 
Now it could run at compile time or runtime. You can use this function in both domains. And third, rely on the optimizer. Write local code. When you have a std sort and you want to sort it applying a special predicate, I want to sort the strings based on their length, for example. Use a lambda, but not a function or a function object. Why? Because a lambda is exactly used in place, and the compiler optimizer can do the best job when it has the most information available. It just enables something. Local code. Second, write simple code. And third, give the compiler hints, such as no accept, file, and so on. A no accept may be the reason why move semantic is applied or not. Concurrency. Threats. You already mentioned it. Prefer G thread instead of thread. Because G thread automatically joins. Don't detach a thread. You can join a thread or detach. I will show you an example to see what I mean. Because when you detach a thread, it's not totally right when you, when you let run this thread in the background so that the created thread can outlive its creator. This means detach. When you detach a thread, you have to be careful that the child thread uh, has the data it needs. This can be quite easy and if I behave here. A, sh a thread should process its data. Or the, let me put it differently. Should, um, the data should be local. By the way, there are two meta rules to, to threading. Be as constant and be as local as possible. And here, this is one rule of it. And finally, this is, by the way, a nice example for shared pointers. This is, by the way, my favorite example for, sh for the use of shared putter. Assume you have 10 threads. All use one variable, which is constant. All of them use them. When can you delete this variable? When do you know the last thread is, is done with its job? You don't know it, because this is exactly what you don't know when you do threading. What do you do? You put this shared thing into a shared variable. Therefore, when the counter becomes zero, it's automatically uh, destroyed and cleaned up. This is an extremely nice use case for a shared pointer. And now, let me show you an example. And now I have to type something, which makes a lot of fun. No, wrong. Let me put it here. Here we are. Oh. This is so complicated. When, ah, here, here's my button. Yep. Here we are. And of course, I'm way too... Okay. Let me show you the example. This makes it easier for me. Okay, what do I have here? A function... Func, which has a string initialized with C++11, the thread T takes the std string by reference. Then I detach, then I uh, change S to C++14. And finally, finally I detach the thread. On the right, there's the output. Can you see the output? I, you see, let me put it differently. Do you see an issue with this program? Let me, sorry, I should not ask two questions at the same time. Let me continue with the first question. Can you see the output? Can you see Stutze out, this string? What is happening here? Where's my output? We don't know it. I see your point. There are many issues here. 
First of all, before my thread is able to display this C string, the process is destroyed. This is a, a data race, kind of. We don't know. Because why? Stutze out does not belong to my child thread, it belongs to the main process. And therefore, with a little bit of luck, we could see something, but we don't know. This is an optical issue, but there's a way, way, way more critical issue here, which I hope I can show you because I have to write something. What is the issue here? Oh, this is terrible. What is the issue with this program? This program has a data race. Why? Oh no, I have to write something co totally complicated. Minus F sanitize thread. I hope I did it right. Yeah, I did it right. You know, I don't need glasses. I can do it only in my head. Okay, warning thread sanitizer data race. Who sees this data race? This is obvious, have a look. In the thread, S is displayed. And afterwards, I change it to C++14. This is a read-write at the same time, it's a data race. And to detect this, you need tools. And what I used here was this F sanitize, the sanitizer. When you do threading, use each tool you could get to verify your code. And one extremely good tool is the sanitizer, and in this case, the flavor thread. And let me go back. Let me go back. Here we are. But I see something different anyway. I look in this direction. Yeah, you see. Use any tool you could, can get when you validate your threading code. One tool I showed you is the sanitizer. Here you see the right, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the correct command line. I forgot, uh, I intentionally forgot minus G because it was too complicated to write. And this tool is integrated in GCC since 4.8, in Clang since 3.2. You just have it. Or when you play with atomic stuff, use CPVMM, but this is different, yeah. Any question so far? Let's continue here. Error handling. Mm. Error handling. When you do error handling, what should you think about? First of all, you should detect the error. This is true. Second, you should transmit information about an error to some er handler code. Third, you should preserve the valid state of a program. If you don't know, after an error, if your program is in a valid state, forget it, shut it down. And last, you should not have memory leaks or any leaks, be more, to be more general. This is what you should think about when you do error handling. It's not only about error, it's about all of these four aspects. Let me skip constants. Do we have here templates? Let me say a few words about templates. I'm almost done. A silly question I often have in my classes is, when do you want to use a template? The answer is extremely straightforward. When I have something to do which does not only apply to one type, therefore you need a template. When you have an idea such as add, swap, this not, does not only apply to one, this applies to many types. 
Therefore, you should use a template. A few rules. When you have a function, such as std sort, which can be invoked with something callable, a predicate, a function which decides which of the two values are bigger, use a lambda for readability reasons and for performance reasons, because we know it's the fastest one. Don't specify template argument. Let the compiler do the stuff. You, you know what I said? The less you program, the better your program will be. Let the compiler do the stuff. Since C++ 17, you can also do this for classes. You don't have to say std vector of int. You could just say std vector and initialize it. The compiler will deduce, hey, this is an int. For function templates, we can it since 98. And here's the point once more with regular and semi-regular, you know. Template arguments should be at least semi-regular or regular. Semi-regular is a little bit weaker than regular. It just means all regular without equality. Regular once more means big six, swappable, and equality comparable. Okay. This is trivial. You should not use a C-array. And the rule is extremely simple. Your best friends are array, std array and std vector. You should use an array if you know its size at compile time and it's small. And you should use a vector when you don't know the size at compile time or, here's the or, or it's big because our array cannot be so big, because it's on the stack. Stack has only one to two megabyte. Why do you want to use this stuff? Of course, we know it. The main point is always, it has an ideal memory layout, Minus, meaning vector and strings are optimized for reading. Sorry, string also, but also vector, array, and string. But here I only talk about vector and array. And Finally, this, are, this is your first choice. Sorry once more for a little bit irritated, irritating here uh, with the internet and with my, my presentation. Here are a few final thoughts. First of all, there are two books about the core guidelines. The worst first one is mine. It, and the second one is from Guy Davidson and Kate Gregory, both are excellent, at least the other one. So if you want to know more, you, you can have them. Uh, Bjarne already uh, presented them in the keynote. Just, uh, okay. Second, I have written more than 100 posts about the core guidelines. You can read the stuff. Just go to Modernist C++. It's not a type of modernist, it's a German word for modern, modernist C++. You know it, of course. <laughs> Finally, of course, I'm a trainer and I'm a mentor. Okay, this is all what I have to do for self-marketing. Oh, fine. 28 minutes, two, two minutes to, to let, well, okay, but it's fine. Once more, sorry for the irritation. Do you have questions? Go on. Um, in, the, in the first slide, you, you made the comparison with the Mr. C package. Exactly. Mr. C++, not, not Mr. C++. Mr. C++. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, normally, what you do is use static code analysis to... Ah, good point. Thanks a lot. S such stuff is also available for the core guidelines, the co guidelines support library. What do you mean by updated? Now I'm well, I mean the, you know, the, the latest uh, versions. You mean the, the core guidelines, the guidance support library? I'm, I'm not sure. I'm assuming they are kind of in lex, lockstep. And you can use them. It's a header only stuff. And you can use them extremely nicely in Windows OS Clang Tidy. But I used them the last time 
one year ago. One additional point here. The guideline support library is a library only of header, uh, implemented in header, which you can use to check if your code fulfills the guidelines. And then you get the answer, you broke this rule or something like that. And you can also define your own rule set. But this would go too far here. I explained a little bit in my books or in my posts, but this is similar to Mistra C++. We have tools which help you to verify is our code C++, uh, C++ core guidelines conformant or not. Thanks. Um, I have a question. Um, thank you for the talk and uh, sorry for the unforeseen technical difficulties. Mm -hmm. It's not most difficult, yeah. Sorry, sorry. It's not <laughs> my issue. Yeah. Uh, my question is regarding the C20's uh, spaceship operator. And we can set the spaceship operator to equal to default, and compiler will automatically generate all the six uh, operators for us. Exactly. So, what do you? Do you have any thoughts about... Uh, Honestly, I had this discussion with Biane. I said to Biane, it makes no sense when I write now a book about best practice in C++ 20, in 20 before, C, before C++ 20. You can only write about best practices when the practices are established. Right. When I update the book, I will say something about it, but I can say it now, just use it. I just default the spaceship operator and if you only want equal and non-equal default the equal operator both works okay okay thank you but once more this is when i will update the book and then i will talk about concepts and all the interesting stuff modules but we are not in the stage state now of saying we know the best practices about c it's too early okay thanks Okay, it's over, you see it.